All right, welcome in everybody here. Let me make sure we get in our other couple groups here. See if we can get some spinning check marks here. And here we go. All right, welcome into Building the Broncos. I am your host here, Carl Dumbler. And once again, two weeks in a row, getting joined by a special guest. And we got Mr. Eric Trickle coming in to chat up some, some Bronco football with us. And Eric, appreciate you joining us this evening. And how are things going out there in good old Alaska? Well, they're going good, but apparently I just discovered that my cat's in my office. So she's clawing at the door. So if you guys hear that, I apologize. <laughs> um normally i try to make sure she's out but it's going good yesterday was really nice i mean we had wonderful weather and just expected to turn for the worst now but everything's going good i'm still recovering from our from the vacation that me and my family went on but and uh you know i'm just trying to catch back up with what news there has been of the broncos and um all the running backs which is the topic of conversation tonight being cut in the last basically last week yeah very eye-opening and i'm excited to jump into it i'm glad to be here and glad to join you yeah. Well, before we get to our topic here today, I wanted to give some shout outs to some of our listeners that have already chatted in. We got David coming in saying, good evening, Broncos country, Nick, Carl, Dylan, and Deacon Scott, hashtag MHH for life, hashtag Buckham times three, hashtag Denver Broncos for life. Good to see you, David. Always, always nice to see you in here. We got Mike S coming in saying, what's up, Carl, Eric, Scott, Dylan, and Broncos country. Mike, always good to see you with the, the Alabama picture there. Saw an interesting debate the other day of whether Georgia has taken over as the the top tier of college football, or does Alabama still belong in that conversation? But uh, we got Seth coming in saying, "Hey, fellas, hey to you as well, there, Seth." And of course, we got Dylan Von Arks saying, "It's up, Bronco country." Make sure you hit that like button on the way in, share on all platforms, and subscribe if you haven't already. Yes, like, share, subscribe, all those things. We really appreciate that. Helps get it out there to everybody to be able to tune in each week. And we got Polico coming in saying updates today. I'm guessing updates on the running back position, maybe. I don't, I'm not quite 100% sure on that one, but we'll uh, we'll get to some updates on that position for sure. We got Kevin Gray saying, evening, guys. I tried to get Broncos for breakfast, but no show. What up, Nick, Carl, and Scott? Uh, Nick, I think he's kind of he's preoccupied, which is why he's not here tonight. But uh, we'll see if building Broncos or uh, Broncos for breakfast. I'm not sure if it'll be back next week or. I, oh, yep. Scott's giving me the, the thumbs up. So, yes. And we got Kevin Gray saying evening Broncos country. Big mile high salute. And Michael Room coming in saying evening all. Who do you think has the best chance to replace a starter? My money is on Caden Stearns. Eric, how would you answer this question? I mean, Caden Stearns is a good bet. He was the guy that they wanted to take a starter, and Kareem Jackson was brought back just kind of as insurance for him. And it's not entirely certain that Kareem Jackson makes the roster. The starting duo is expected to be Justin Simmons and Caden Stearns. So that that's that's a really good bet. Um, for me, who do I think has the best chance to replace the starter? Um, hmm. You want me to give mine while you, you think about it? Yeah. I'll go Alex Forsyth. I mean, center position, I mean, you could put any name in there right now and say that guy's going to be the starter for the Broncos just because Lloyd Cushenberry, horrible, horrible start to, to his NFL career. I mean, he's got the leg up because he's been the starter and he's going to get that first crack at it. But it really would not surprise me to see Forsyth um, take over that position. I mean, a lot of people talked well of him coming into the draft. Didn't test well, obviously. But when we're talking about intelligence, you know, he's got a little bit more physicality to him when we're trying to become a more running team at, up front. I, I could see the Broncos really going in that kind of direction. And he is a Sean Payton draft pick yeah. where Lloyd Cushenberry, not, I, he might not even make the roster at this point. We don't know. He could be as much the starter as he could be off the roster. Yeah. And one thing with Alex Forsyth, too, is that really hindered him was he was dealing with a hamstring injury throughout the process. And there were people that I spoke to that they're like, we viewed him as a top 100, top 150 guy, but we just couldn't see enough of him during the process, eyes on firsthand because of that hamstring injury. Um, and that, that caused him to fall a little bit. So, so that's a pretty good pick. I was considering him, but it just comes back to his Sean and Sean Payton is pretty favorable about playing rookies. 
but will he turn to the sixth round draft pick rookie like as the starting starter uh, I could see it for the reasons you said being more physical up front he definitely brings that he's a much better fit for what they want to do and Lloyd Cushenberry I mean this is his third coaching staff he's ended up in the doghouse for two of them already so I could see it um oh I I, I don't I can't really think of another one besides Caden Stearns or Alex Forsyth even as a possibility. Um, maybe, you know, and we, we got a super chat here and maybe Uwazarike or Matt Henningsen can step up and take in one of the starting uh, starting spots open on the defensive line because they still really haven't replaced Deshaun Williams. So that's still very much up for the grabs. So maybe one of them. I, I don't really have a certain guy to answer this question. Yeah. And speaking of that super chat, we got Troy Boer coming in saying, Hey guys, what is a typical and realistic jump in the second year for defensive linemen? How good can a Ruzurike and Henningsen be Troy really appreciate the super chat. And it, it, that's a great question because it is one of the, the tougher positions as a rookie to make a big impact, but years two and three, that's where we really get to see a little bit of what these guys can become in the NFL, you know, get used to that NFL strength, used to guys that actually are technically sound. So what what can you expect from either of these guys moving into year two? I, I mean, obviously with Uazurike, you just want to see more growth, and I think we'll see it. He had a really tough transition, and it really got crapped on a lot because of, you know, what he did as a rookie. And he started to show improvement as a, there towards the end of the season. But he went from playing basically a stand-up edge at Iowa State in their weird front to playing a 3-4 eye technique. And that's very different. And what you got to, and what, how you, the techniques that you use are very different. So he had a large, you know, area of growth that he had to do, and he started to show it. So I could see him maybe not make that jump to starter, but I could see him being having a decent role on it if he continues his growth. As for Henningsen, he's the guy, if I had to pick one of these two to be, to compete, to take that starting job over from Deshaun Williams, Henningsen would be it just because he doesn't have a lot of growth to do. He's very, like, he's kind of hit his ceiling. It's not very high. He just had a high floor. Didn't have a lot that he had to work on. It's just a matter of figuring out how it is they want to use him. Yeah. No, I'm, I'm with you there. I mean, he he got the first crack at it when they had some of the injuries coming in. And uh, speaking of coming in, we got Michael always coming in every single day saying, good evening, Carl and Eric on building the Broncos. Go Broncos and buck them. Michael, appreciate the stars out there. And I uh, appreciate all of you just joining us here this evening. And, and Phil, of course, another one coming in each night for us saying, good evening, Carl, Eric, and Deacon Scott. You guys think McLaughlin will be third and running back? Hashtag Buckham, hashtag MHH for life. Well, that kind of gets us into our, our topic today. Uh, the Broncos once again cut another running back. This third and about a week that the Broncos have cut. So they cut Tyreek and McAllister, uh, Jacquez pa Patrick, and uh, Damari and Crockett are the three that they just cut. So obviously any running backs that are left, they have at least a decent thought of them at this point, but I'm not so sure that the third running back or second running back or whatever you want, I, whatever position they take, I'm not sure that they're on this roster right now. Is that where you're at too, Eric? Or are you thinking that they're stuck with the, the ones that they have? Oh, I think you're muted. I definitely think they're looking elsewhere. Um, I mean, in the article, Mike Kliss had today his mailbag. He mentioned Dalvin Cook as a possibility. That's been a connected link there for a month now, ever since you know every, Dalvin Cook getting cut was first brought up. There's been links with Kareem Hunt going back to early March, even end of February. There's been links with Ezekiel Elliott ever since he's been cut. They've been linked with other running backs to try and bring in another veteran to help round out this room. And honestly, it's going to be it's going to be the number two guy or number three, just depending on what the situation is with Javante Williams. If Javante Williams is back and ready to go by the start of the season, he's your number one guy. P. Ryan is your number two. This guy's your number three. So just some added insurance for it. Um, all depends on what happens with Dalvin Cook, I think. I, if he, Whenever he does get cut. Will he ring chase or will he be able to be willing to step back? And, you know, will the familiarity with George Payton be enough or are they going to be forced to look elsewhere? 
Yeah. Part of the reason I do like Dalvin Cook is he's a little bit different running back than P. Ryan or Williams. You know, both them power running backs want to get, you know, north to south where Cook gives you a little bit more athleticism compared to like an Ezekiel Elliott um, or a Kareem Hunt. You know, all those guys are power running backs. And, and I kind of worry if you don't have at least a little bit, which is I think why Phil's asking this question about McLaughlin, because he is that speed guy, offers that little bit of little bit of punch that, I mean, one play he could be gone. And so I, I do like him for that that purpose. But uh, but beyond that, like I said, I, if Dalvin Cook becomes available and he's willing to take at least a sensible deal, I mean, you're not going to get him cheap. He's still going to take decent money. But if he's willing to come in, I think that's a really nice pairing with either P. Ryan or Williams, really. Yeah. And I do think that one thing you have to balance out, too, is P. Ryan. Because when you get, brought him in, you were telling him that he's going to be the number one, number two back, with depending on Javante Williams' status. And now, if you're going to go look at um, Dalvin Cook, you're probably looking at six to eight million at least on an average per year basis. Like that's making it very clear to P. Ryan that you're the number two guy. Then you're going down to number three whenever Javante Williams is back. Also, I got it. And talking about it too is with um, McLaughlin, um, the undrafted free agent running back. He is one of two types. Of that, or one of the two running backs of that type on it. Tyler Beatty's the other one, and he only got two touches. So, right now, for that different type of back, that not necessarily scat back type, but the explosive home run threat, you know, the big yardage kind of guy um, ability, they only have two guys on the roster that have a total of two carries in the NFL or two touches in the NFL. I think that's the style they're looking for. That's why I've kind of always shrugged off Ezekiel Elliott. Um, Leonard Fournette, he's another one. Kareem Hunt, I think, can make a little bit of sense, even though he d- isn't exactly that explosive guy. He does have a little bit more of that. Um, and then J.D. McKissick as well. He's another one, If you, but he's older. He's on the wrong side of 30 now. He's one of the other ones of the free agents that stand out of that mold. Yeah. So, all right, I wanted to get to something else here. I did want to point out uh, Broncos for Breakfast will be back on Thursday for everybody that – that loves to tune in for the, the morning show, have their, their coffee with Scott and Nick. I want to make sure everybody knows, don't worry, back on Thursday, tune in, everyone. And, uh, yeah, I'm with you. Like I said, I, I think they do. They wanted a little bit different kind of running back. You like to have a little bit of variety. You know, Nick always talks about with the wide receiver room, you like to have kind of like uh, on a basketball court where you got your center, you got your point guard, you got your shooting guard, you got a little bit of different flavors that can attack a team in different ways. I think it's the same with the running back position. You like to have that lightning and thunder guys that can really attack you in different ways. And, you know, depending on the team that you're playing, you can play a little bit of the hot hand of, uh, but I still, if, if they don't bring in anybody else, it's still going to be the P Ryan and William show. And I think if they don't bring anybody else in, do you, you think it, it symbolizes that, uh, that they really trust that Williams is going to be ready for week one. I mean, if they're putting all their eggs in that basket, it'd be really tough for me because his injury, he had the ACL, the I believe the LCL and the PCL, all of that damage done in his knee, and that is just such a risky injury to come back for come back from, um, especially in less than a year. I think no matter what, they're looking at adding insurance. If it is if they do go out and they I don't think Dalvin Cook will be the guy, but if he is, if they are willing to go out and pay that six to eight million dollars for him, I think that is a negative sign for John Javante Williams and how long he's going to be back. Yeah. If they go out and try to get somebody like a JD McKissick or Kareem Hunt for somewhere around two to three million on an average per year basis, I think that's a pretty good sign that maybe he not be re- maybe he won't be ready by the start of the season, but maybe you know week four is when you're looking at getting Javante Williams back. Yeah. All right, we got a couple of super chats, but I didn't want to get to this. Uh, Douglas Wall coming in saying, hello, everyone. How did Ben Powers get left off the PFF top 32? Just curious if it was a mistake or if they think he is really that bad. Uh, I think he tested out as the 38th best offensive guard last year, according to PFF. And, you know, I, I don't think he was the 38th at that level. I think he was higher than that, really, if you watch what he's been bringing to the NFL. I think sometimes, especially when they're grading the offensive line, they don't always know what's a win, in my opinion. 
you know, a lot of times if, if the guy's not like pancake or if he's not moving somebody, they're kind of like, uh, it's a, it's a neutral. He just neutralized his guy. Well, at offensive line, a lot of times just neutralizing your guy, that's a win. Like if your guy's not the one that's making the play, you, you've pretty much done your job in my opinion. I mean, there, there's still more nuance to it than that, but I think there's times where they kind of miss how much that can impact a game just by neutralizing a guy. Yeah, I've the grades of pro football focus on guards has always been questionable to me year after year, especially with the Broncos, especially. I'm not very familiar. I mean, they have different guys who grade out for different teams and everything. So just because like which just makes it more question like more hard for me to accept, I guess. Because one guy could see a maybe they start off slow and they come back to win the rep. Some guy could be a little bit more harsher on that than a guy who, than somebody else. Somebody you could say is like, well, even though they lost early, they still came back to win the rep. Like they still got the, they got the hole cleared, even though the early penetration or whatever. So that is just kind of a question mark I have with profile, pro football focus. And I've had a lot of issues with pro ball, pro football focuses grading for years now, going back to before I even joined Chad covering the Broncos. Um, for different reasons for it. So I didn't see, I didn't see the rankings or anything like that. I'll be curious about what the qualifiers were, um, all that stuff. But I watched Ben, I watched Ben powers. I've watched a lot of him to me. He's a, he's a top 10 guard at least from what I've seen of him. Yeah. But uh, yeah, we got this from, from Scott saying that he had an 86.7 pass block grade. Nope. Yep. Okay. And a 50 run grade. <laughs> and again, there I, I don't think that that's the case at all. I mean, obviously, Baltimore, one of the best running teams in football the last about four or five years. Now, part of that's Lamar Jackson, but also that offensive line has just been outstanding for them when it comes to the run blocking. Again, he's not out there like destroying people. You know, he's not that kind of guy. If that's what you're expecting from him coming here into Denver, he's not going to bring that to you but he's going to do his job well. Like he knows what he's supposed to do. He's technically sound and he's going to be a huge upgrade over what they had a left guard last year. I can tell you that much at least. And then we got Gary Palmer coming in with the 999 super saying, hi, Carl, Eric, Scott, Dylan, and Broncos country. Do you think the defense will be as good or better or worse? Hashtag Buckham. So let's start off because I think sometimes that can be very general coach, defensive coordinator. Did they upgrade, downgrade? Where where would you put going to to Vance Joseph? See, this is a lot tough. It's very easy to say downgrade because um, Evero had such a good year. But how much of that was carrying over from McVangio? And Vance Joseph is quite hated for what the Broncos did during his tenure as head coach. But there's a failure to realize that his defenses have been consistently pretty good. Yeah. Really good. Outside of this last year in Arizona, they've been a really good unit. Um I, I I'm gonna say that they th this is tough for me also because I'm it's just I'm gonna say they're about even with what they were last year. Maybe, maybe a slight downgrade, but not be not necessarily um not just because of Vance Joseph, but because of the slight changes that are coming to the scheme. I think that right there is going to see a slight decrease on the field. Okay. You know, it, all of this has to be what injuries are going to happen. You know, like if Randy Gregory can stay healthy for an entire season, they could be a pretty darn good defense. Yeah. They could have a great pass rush. You know, Zach Allen, if he can stay healthy for an entire year, Baron Browning, can he stay healthy for an entire year? You know, last year they they lost Justin Simmons for a few games for the first time. You know, is he going to be healthy? Your number two cornerback, whoever is going to be starting on that side, are they going to be healthy? Um, as a as a unit, like if everybody is healthy for for the most part, you're going to have some kind of injury at some point. Uh, but if they can stay relatively healthy, looking back at like the 2015 year where most of those guys played almost every game. I think that the Bron the defense could actually end up better. Mm -hmm. And I think part of that also could be because you're going to have a stronger run game. You're going to have fewer drives that are going to have to go against them. They're going to be less worn out. 
you know, you've got a better offense. that's going to maybe put up some points, put you in a better position to actually go have success. Or maybe you can pin your ears back and actually get after the quarterback and not be like, well, we're down by two touchdowns. Are they going to pass? Are they going to run? What are they going to do here? You know, they have to pass to catch up. And so I think a combination of those things could lead to at least statistically the defense being better. Yeah. I'm with you losing Bradley Chubb. That was a huge loss. Uh, I know like you got decent trade back with the trade, but he was still a really good player. You know, you lost Von Miller, another great player. Uh, Jones, another great player. You know, I know he didn't leave on the best of terms, but Draymond Jones was one of your best pass rushers on the team, especially from the interior. It's going to be hard to replace him. I like Zach Allen. I do. But yeah. they're a little bit different in how they go about their jobs. And I think he's a little bit better against the run than what Draymond brought, but I think he's a little bit less against the pass. Yeah, and I'm I'm fully in agreement there. That just puts more pressure on this pass rush unit that for years after you trade away your top guy has just been stagnant. I mean, you trade away Bradley Chubb and there's almost no pressure from off the, from your edges. Trade away Von Miller and there's almost no pressure from your edges. So without Draymond Jones, at least he was providing some pretty solid and consistent pressure on the inside before he got hurt. I mean, he was in the top five in almost every single statistical ca category when it comes to interior defensive linemen and their ability to get after the quarterback and pressure rates and all that. Um, so Randy Gregory being able to stay out there on the field is so so vital because yeah you lost Draymond Jones and you upgraded as a run defender but you now you don't have that pass rush ability that he brought not saying Zach Allen's bad he's actually a pretty capable pass rusher yeah. himself he's just not on that level that Draymond Jones was um so it's a it's a huge drop off and it just relies on so much and the injuries with all the injuries they suffered last year got to you know give credit to Evro. He kept the defense together, even though eventually they started to crack. Um, but uh, it just, everything just makes it so hard to say, is the defense going to be better or worse when there's this many changes? Yeah. <clears throat> and then we got Chris Chances coming in with the $5 super saying, what do you think about our new Sith Lord, Sean Payton? Would love to see the Chiefs fall to the dark side once again. Hashtag best in the business. Hashtag DB for life. Uh, well, first off, unfortunately, the Chiefs, their fall is not going to happen until Andy Reid and Patrick Mahomes are out of that building. You know, it, it just Patrick Mahomes by himself is probably worth eight wins. Andy Reid's probably worth another about three every single season. So you can pencil them in for about 11 wins almost every year, especially now that they've gone to 17, 17 games. But doesn't mean the Broncos can't stand a chance to actually get back up there and and be in competition for for the division. But I do love Sean Payton. I love what he's been bringing to the team. You can tell this is very much a, a business setting. Last year was kind of the circus. This year it's really being run. Hey, this is how we do things. You're going to do it or you're going to get out of here. And, uh, you know, you just see the professionalism coming back. And I know some people were not happy. Did you see the, the saying that they have on their shirts now? Mm -hmm. this season? It's uncommon. And... Ben Powers, I think, was one of them that was talking about it. And he said, uh, the reason that we put that is it's uncommon to win in the NFL. And just trying to get that, that mentality of you have to work your tail off to become a winning organization. It doesn't just happen. You know, everybody's talented here. It's not like college football where Alabama could probably not even have a single practice and beat 75% of the teams in college football without running a single practice. You know, just because they have that much of a, a talent disparity – compared to everybody else. It's not the way in the NFL. Yeah, I think I think a couple of weeks ago when I was doing a Friday night with Scott, we got a question about if this is the year that the – maybe it was with Chad. If this was the year that the Broncos could finally, you know, end that losing streak against the Chiefs. I would love to see it. I just don't think the Broncos are there yet. As you said, like, as long as Andy Reid and Patrick Mahomes are part of the Chiefs, they are always going to be, you know – the favorite in the division essentially they just work so well together and Patrick Mahomes is so freakishly talented it drives me nuts um it'll take a lot of luck on the Broncos you know to have a quarterback that can go and compete with him and not trying to throw shade on Russell Wilson I expect him to be better but he's still nowhere near that level of Patrick Mahomes so there's no doubt about that um so 
maybe we can see it, you know, like get a win, but there's no unseating them from the throne. Like until those guys, until those guys are out of Kansas city or, you know, something else happens to them. Uh, there's, there's no unseating the Kansas city chiefs. Right. You know, you think about Tom Brady and the Patriots, Peyton Manning and the Colts, Peyton Manning and the Denver Broncos. There's just certain quarterbacks. Like I said, you can just pretty much key them in that they're going to have 10 plus wins a year. Like that you can stick them on the worst roster in football. And they're still going to be able to bring that kind of talent. Hmm. There's just, they just have that much more talent than everybody else at the most important position. And there's only about two or three quarterbacks in the entire league that you could make that kind of claim for, you know, I'd say Josh Allen, uh, man, I'm trying to think of the three that I would pick. I'm not sure who would be my third, but it'd be Patrick Mahomes, Josh Allen. Who, who would be your third? Oh, it's tough. I think there's a bunch of guys that are right there for that third. You know, there, there's Hertz, there's Joe Burrow. Um, so, so there's a group of guys that are there. Justin Herbert. Yeah. Um, I pro- I probably put Hertz for now, but it's I I mean you could na- you could put about one of five or six guys there, and I wouldn't argue for yeah. about it. Probably Joe Burrow would be my third. Yeah. Just he has that that mental ability to handle the most pressure situations. You know, he's been one of the few that have actually stayed calm when he's playing the chiefs. I think that was one thing that Tom Brady and Peyton Manning always had over a lot of teams was just this, we have to go score. So like teams are like trying to force plays that they otherwise wouldn't have forced. I I saw plenty of games where teams were up by like 14 and they're like, Oh, we got to keep scoring. We got to keep going and doing all these things. And, and then all of a sudden they make a few mistakes and that's all that Tom Brady or Peyton Manning need. And Joe Burrow is one of those few guys that just stays cool in those moments and says, nope, I'll still go make a play. And so that's probably why I'd put him at that third spot. Yeah. Um, I want to grab this comment one real quick. Um, Harold Jean, Mahomes loves throwing into the Broncos. I wish that were true. It would be so much easier to upset them if that was the case. But in 11 games, he's only thrown eight interceptions to the Broncos. And only once has he thrown more than one in a game. So it's... Unfortunately, that's not the case. I wish it was because, you know, it's always easier to beat, you know, these top level teams when they, you know, give you extra opportunities. Mm -hmm. Is it Josie Jewell that had two interceptions in one game against him? Uh, Yes, I think that was that was the one game where he had more than one. and He ended up with three on the game. Yeah. Yeah, that was that was a great moment. I'm, (laughs) I'm excited to have Josie Jewell back out on the field and see what he can can bring for that defense. But uh Let's see. I wanted to get to this. John P. Saul saying Vikings aren't straight up releasing Cook. That is crazy talk. I don't think it's that crazy. He's what scheduled to make like 10, 12 million dollars at the running back position. And for NFL teams, they're not sitting there trading and saying, I want to take that kind of money on one. There's not a lot of teams that can with their cap situation. You've got maybe half the league that could take on. You'd have to restructure, do something with it to, to make it fit under your cap. Broncos are one of those teams where it'd be really tough to make that that contract work if he's not cut. And I think a lot of teams are realizing, hey, the if we don't trade for him, the Vikings are going to cut him, and then we get to do all the, the negotiating that we want with them. And so, um, and you can get him for maybe half the price kind of thing than than what he's wanting right now. So I, I don't think it's that crazy to think that he could be cut. Yeah, I mean they save more they save more money by cutting him than trading him and another team doesn't get stuck with the contract that's left. So they don't have any initiative trade for him because then you're pulling it, taking all that money on and giving up cheap draft picks for it. So it just doesn't work out um, for them to, to trade him. And there's a reason why all the chatter is going to be that he's going to be cut. I mean, it's been expected to happen already. It just hasn't happened yet. Um, They're just trying to figure out some things from what I understand. Vikings are trying to figure out a way to, you know, rework the contract a little bit to save them a little bit more money um, and see what they can do with that. And, but it's he'll he'll be, probably be cut at some point. Yeah. And then I, I did want to get to, there's quite a bit of discussion between uh, D-Hop and Dalvin Cook. Which one would you, if let's say everything's completely the same, contract-wise, which one would you rather have the Broncos go after? Dalvin Cook. 
like with the way the receiver room looks like it's is it great no um tim patrick coming back from an injury what is Cortland sutton going to be for for denver this year will jerry judy finally actually have that breakout here um marvin mims can we see him step up maybe kj hamler like you have guys there running back you need somebody who can be more complimentary to what you have and denver doesn't have that so for me it's dalvin cook yeah right now you have one known commodity at the running back position p ryan samaj p ryan he's the only one you know what he's going to be bringing to this team you know as much as we we like to think javante williams is going to be what he was before nobody can say with 100 percent certainty you know I, I hope he brings 90 percent of what he was before i'd still be a great running back in the nfl but so like i said right now you have one known player at the running back position where wide receiver you, you like i said you might not have a true number one top tier kind of guy mm-hmm. but you've got three probably solid number twos and then you got a rookie that was your your first pick for your coach that you probably want to get on the field as much as possible and so i, I can't see them really wanting to go after wide receiver with that that level of you know four guys and then you still got kj hamler that maybe you have a little bit of hope that he could turn into something so there's about four or five guys at that spot you feel pretty comfortable with yeah i mean and then there's the whole thing of like you talked about the contracts being equal but you still have a little bit of the personality aspect to deal with it it's a little bit easier to appease a running back when you only have like one maybe two guys there compared to a wide receiver who not i don't not in a bad way but has notoriously been very much a give me the ball get me the ball kind of receiver very much easier to appease the running back in this situation in the situation denver's at than where the um where they are with wide receiver and deandre hopkins yeah all right we had a couple other questions come in here that i wanted to get to um i wanted to say hello to, to malcolm brown coming in from homer alaska Always good to, to see you in here as well. And then uh, Robert Bishop says, Broncos need running backs because they are going to be busy while Wilson gets in the groove. Yeah, I, I would agree. I think they're going to be a very run-heavy team early on, try to get everybody into the to a rhythm. You know, I think a lot of what they want to do in the passing game is going to take a little bit of time to develop. And so, if, yeah, if you can become a really strong running team and make teams have to really defend that, it makes playing quarterback so much easier. You know, if they're playing single high coverage, Russell Wilson's actually very good as a quarterback against single high coverage. Just a lot of teams pretty much are daring the Broncos to run last year, saying we're going to play two high, four high, whatever it's going to be, and good luck. You're going to have to cl- complete all these underneath rows or run against us. And they did not have a team that was set up to do that. Yeah, and I think we're going to be seeing a Broncos team that they're going to be looking at a heavier balance in the running game. Maybe not as heavy running as the Chicago Bears were, but maybe somewhere around what the Philadelphia Eagles, you know, the Washington Commanders, maybe what they run what they were, which is about 550 rushing attempts to about 350 passing attempts. From what everything that has been said, every, from the looks of everything, with, with the moves they've made, Running the ball is going to be the focus of the offense, and they're going to let Russell Wilson cook off of what they prepare and ready for him, trying to get him into single defenses, into single high coverage that he does do well against and get favorable matchups by wearing down the defense. So that's a great point, Robert Bishop. They need running backs because they are going to be busy. All right, so I wanted to get to this thought too. Uh, There's a lot of people talking about this Vance Joseph defense and and what it's going to look like for the Broncos. And I know a lot of people are pretty much down on him because of his time here in Denver as a head coach, but I I guess what, what are going to be some of the differences we see in advanced Joseph defense compared to, to what the Broncos ran last year? Well, I think that there's going to be a lot of similarities. I think it's just going to be a little more of, you know, pressing at the line of scrimmage. I think that's going to be the big difference. Um, We're going to see a lot of press two man, um, we're going to see some, uh, you know, cover three, um, and then cover one as well, press cover one. 
Um, so, so we're going to see a good variety of that. He loves to press his corners, you know, jam up receivers at the line. So to help his guys, because he's very aggressive, aggressive getting after the quarterback to buy them more time. And with Evero, he was very aggressive getting after the quarterback, but he didn't really press a lot, not with everyone really. And I think that's going to be the biggest difference. Instead of just basically Sertan pressing at the line of scrimmage, we're going to see it from both guys on the boundary, you know, just to buy the extra second, second and a half for your aggressive blitzers to get after the quarterback. All right. Then we've got Kevin Peterson coming in saying, Carl, what do you think the passing offense looks like? Mainly 10 yard digs with Michael Thomas down in New Orleans. I think it's going to look a little different than that. I, I think you're going to see a little bit of, of what they did that last year with Sean Payton, where he didn't have Drew Brees as his quarterback. And he was hitting a lot of the, I would say the the deep outs. There, there's a lot of those plays where they they really liked it with uh, who was their quarterback that time. Um, all of a sudden, I'm spacing on his name, the former no, number one over a pick from Florida State. But they they yeah. like it. That, that was his setup. He loved those those deep outs, the deep routes, uh, just getting pushing it down the field a little bit more compared to Drew Brees, who was more of that true pocket passer timing. We're gonna hit him before you know, the pass rush can get here. A lot of what Peyton Manning did when he was here in Denver. And so with Russell Wilson, you're going to see a lot of that. Um, they've got guys that can go win deep. So, you know, that's why they went and drafted Marvin Mims, his ability to go win deep. You got Cortland Sutton who can make a lot of jump ball plays. He didn't do it much last year. And I think that was his worst year that I've seen him in those 50, 50 balls, in my opinion, since he's been with the Broncos. Um, but Jerry Judy, again, another guy that has enough speed to win over the top. It's not quite his game, but he can win a lot of those deep outs, those deep ends. Uh, so uh, there's going to be some of those comeback routes but or those digs. I, I just think because those are such timing routes, that's not really what Russell Wilson's game. You're still going to have it be a part of your offense just because teams need to respect it. But beyond that, it's just not going to be a consistent part of the offense, in my opinion. I think we're going to see a lot of routes to take advantage of spacing, you know, those crosser routes, um, those outs, those ends, you know, those, those kinds of routes that you're trying to catch it as right off the break. The, you get that little bit of separation and the ball is going to be there. Simplified reads for Russell Wilson to help make those those timing routes and with the separation, just make it work a little bit, which is kind of what, was, what Sean Payton was doing there in that final year, you know, going from – um, Jamie's Winston to Teddy Bridgewater to Taysom Hill. That was one pretty constant thing. There was very was attacking separation um, or maximizing separation with timing. Yeah, and like I said, I think you got the receivers that play well to that style. And if Tim Patrick is back again, we don't know if he's going to be a hundred percent or not. I, I think you're going to. He's another one that can attack deep for you. So defenses are going to have to really respect that. But again, if you're a strong running team, they're going to have to pick and choose. Are we going to let them beat us deep? Or are we going to let them beat us with the run game? And most teams usually pick, we're going to let them beat us with the run game because eventually we can stop it. You know, eventually we're going to get one big play that really halts the, the offense. Um, so I think, I mean, if I was a betting man, if I was really getting into fantasy football, I would definitely be picking up some Broncos running backs. They're going to get lots of carries this year. And, and they're also going to be a big part of the passing game, too. You know, it's part of what P. Ryan brings to the offense. He's not going to be a take a, a quick screen pass and take it for a touchdown, but he's got good hands. He's got good route running, and he's a good third down running back for you. You know, since we're talking about the running back position, it's part of why, like I said, he's promised, hey, you're at least going to be the number two for us this year. And a big part of that is because he has that ability to play all three downs for you if Javante Williams is not ready. Uh, I do feel like it would be I, I would hate to see it for him if they do go get a Dalvin Cook, because I'd love to see what P. Ryan could do with a little bit bigger role than what he had there in Cincinnati, because I think he is a really good running back. Um, and I think he could actually be a decent starter for a team. He's not going to be a top tier running back, but I think a decent starter. Uh, we got Phil coming in again saying, do you guys think we cut bowls after this year? If so, what is the cap savings? Um, so yeah, I think that at the very least Bowles won't be back on his current contract next year. I mean, they're looking at trading him this year. It just came it, to me. It was always a situation of you don't have somebody else at tackle right now. 
and you already needed a right tackle and you needed a swing tackle, um, cutting bulls this year didn't make sense. I, I think he's gone after this year. If unless something happens, unless he's extended for a on a much cheaper contract that lowers the cap hit, um, I just don't I don't see him being back. I mean, it would take even an excellent year from him. I don't think is enough to bring him back this year. Um, despite you know everything, you know the great year he had a couple of years ago. That was a couple of years ago. Um, so it's just. It doesn't bode well for Bulls with the contract how it is now for him to be back with the Broncos in 2024. Right. You're exactly right. It'd be a restructure if he is. Yeah. There's no way he's playing at that cap hit with what he's shown. And, and even if he has a good year, I, the Broncos are going to want to figure out a way to get that extension to work on the cap situation and, and try to get his number down. So, um, you know, I, I like Bulls. I think he's been underrated in his time here in Denver, kind of like Josie Jewell, like both of them. Yeah. They're not the top tier of their position, but for the most part, they've done decently. Now the, the glaring holes are very, very glaring, you know, for Garrett Bowles, it's the holding penalties for Josie Jewell. It's the lack of athleticism. And so for a lot of people, they're kind of looking at those going, well, you can't have a player like that. Well, unfortunately there's very few, great offensive tackles out there. It's why the Broncos had to pay so much money for McGlinchey. It's not that he's a great tackle that he should be getting top tier money for the position. But if you want to get even average for the position, you're going to have to pay top tier money once they come up for a contract, you know, Orlando Brown, um, you know, going and getting his contract, he's a little bit better, but still, I don't put him in that top tier level. Uh, you know, then they, the chief signing Juwan Taylor to an even bigger contract than what the Broncos signed McGlinchey to. Again, another player that I don't think earned quite that money, but you're just having to pay for the position because there's such a lack of talent right now yeah. in the NFL. Off the top of your head, how many great tackles would you say there are? How many great and how many good? So I actually had this conversation with somebody the other day. <laughs> I would say that there's maybe six or seven guys that I would qualify as great for the position. And, and I guess, and I'm taking left tackle and right tackle. Yeah. I, I should say that. So left tackle, I would put Laramie Tunsil in there, Trent Williams, Ronnie Stanley when he's healthy, and Colton Miller. I think those would be four of my guys. If I'm looking at right tackle, I'm looking at Lane Johnson. Oh, Tristan Wirfs, mm -hmm. that might be it. Yeah, I'm. I'm probably with you. I probably, I probably have it right about five great ones, and then probably another six or seven that I would consider good, and the rest I, would be just an average to me, like average about slightly above average. It is such a hard position, and the way the college game is going, it's making it much more difficult to bring in talent into the NFL level. It's why good prospects get drafted so high at tackle because you take the best that you have to work with and try to make them into something. Um, why there's a lot of miss or a lot, why there's a lot of misses the way the NFL college offenses are being run. It just doesn't bode well for offensive linemen, especially tackles to translate to the NFL, which goes back to the whole reason as to why it was right to keep bulls this year. But as Scott says in the chat, he's being paid like a top tier tackle and he's not. Um, so you got to try to do something. Hopefully, you know, hopefully McClinchy is the guy at right tackle because the next year it makes it a little bit easier to go and move over to and get, you know, a left tackle instead of having to fill up three. You then only have two because you'll still have to find a swing tackle because Cam Fleming is only on a one year deal. Yeah, I, I think the Broncos are pretty fortunate to get him back at that price. I thought there'd be a team you know, that maybe missed on tackle in the draft that would, would pay him that $5 million. So I feel like the Broncos are pretty fortunate to get him as their swing tackle. Again, yeah. not a great player, but a guy that can come in and give you at least decent play if he's called upon for a little bit. And then I wanted to ask this, since we're on the Garrett Bowles conversation, Chase Walner says, uh, what was Bowles a better fit in zone or power? Where would you put him? His best season was in power. Like overall, he absolutely killed it with Mike Munchak that one year 
It was a lot of power in this offense. Some some inside zone mixed in. Outside zone, uh, I, he has the athleticism. I just don't think he has the eyes and the vision for it. We talk about eyes and vision for running back slot, but it's for tackles too. I mean, you got to see your landmarks. You got to see your guys, and you got to go out there and you got to hit them. And I just don't think Bulls has that. But when the guy's right in there in front of him where he doesn't have to look and find them, he does quite well with his blocking with that. So I think I think what the Broncos are going to this year is a better fit for him. And then I wanted to get to this since we're also on the running back conversation. Kevin Peterson asks, do we split our running backs into the slot, a la Kamara? Uh, both have great hands. Also love Jaleel and what he is showing. I, I think this comes back to the conversation – kind of happened this last week surrounding uh, the tight ends position and how the Broncos are going to use their tight ends and especially Greg Dulcich. Sean Payton called him the, the joker of the offense. And, and what he means by that is a guy that they can move around into different positions and, and still be very successful on offense. So he can play inline tight end. He can play slot tight end. He can play outside wide receiver if you need him on a few plays. Uh, you know, he, he's got that kind of build to him. And so I think if you're looking at a guy that's going to split out into that slot position, I think you're going to see a lot more of Greg Dulcich being that guy, more so than one of the running backs. Yeah, I mean, uh, it's difficult because obviously Kamara, the type of running back he was, was so different. And unless McLaughlin um, steps up and uh, you know really takes the role, I'm not expecting him to have a huge role in the offense in the first place, even if he does win that number three spot. But one of the reasons why that the Broncos were so wanted P Ryan so much is because of his ability out of the backfield as a receiver. Um, he does can work out in the slot a little bit. I think we will see it. I don't think it's going to happen a lot um, just because it's not really fitting with the type of running backs that we have. And even with Dalvin Cook, I think we'll still see it, but I don't think we'd see it a lot if Denver were to bring him in, of course. Yeah, not not as much as what you saw with New Orleans yeah. with, with Kamara. Like I said, he, he's one of those unique running backs. There's about three or four of them that you feel really comfortable moving him out to that slot position, and, and he was one of them. And so I, I'm sure that's going to be one of the things that Sean Payton next offseason is going to be working pretty hard, find that kind of player that you can really use in a unique way in the offense. He, he loves – having guys that have versatility that you can move them out of the backfield, move them to that slot position and an offense or a defense is that they're going, Oh crap, we're screwed. You know, now he's in this spot. What are we going to do? Who's going to cover him? Now we got to stick out a linebacker on him, you know, something like that. That's what having a Kamara or a Christian McCaffrey brings to your offense just makes teams have to figure out how in the world are we going to defend, you know, every inch of this field with a guy that can hit every inch of this field. Yeah, I mean, that's just that's just a great point. I want to grab this comment real quick, going back to what we were talking about with the tackles. Are they average or are they just facing the best players on the field? Well, I mean, it doesn't matter what position you are. Great players go out there and they handle their business, whether they're playing bad players or some of the best players at the on the field. Average players, they're going to go out there and facing good, great, facing the best players on the field. Well, if you're average, then you're going to win some, you're going to lose some. And that's just kind of how it is. Like, that's kind of the defining factor. Like, how do you do against the best players on the field? Do you struggle? Well, then you're probably not great. Do you win a lot? Then you're probably one of the greats. So that's just kind of the line in a way of how you describe or how you place the players. Yeah. And I think another part of this is just, like you said earlier, the college game is just not producing a lot of great offensive tackles. You know, if they have an athlete, a guy that's really athletic, they're going to sit there and say, we need you on defense getting after the quarterback. We need you rushing. And so a lot of times you're just not having your best athletes play offensive line. And the guys that are, you know, I there's a few that I can think of, like Lane Johnson, great athlete, playing offensive tackle. And then you have one of those great combinations of, of talent and, uh, like I said, athleticism and actually will at the position – you know, he's actually pretty smart at what he does. Then you got yourself an incredible player, possibly mm -hmm. Hall of Fame kind of level. But it, it's just find, hard to find all that combination working together. And the college game just has not done a great job of always training up offensive tackles either. You know, it, they just get into these spread systems and just say, hey, 
get your guy blocked for a couple of seconds. Our quarterback will get it out or we'll run it. Call it good. And so a lot of these guys are coming in not very technically sound. And it takes them a while to get going in the NFL. Yeah, and Scott just posted a thing that was an arrow to my heart, you know, in the in the private chat saying Uwazariku was born to be an offensive tackle. And when you look at him, he looks like an offensive tackle. Like he's six foot six. He was what almost 36 inch arms, if I remember correctly. Uh, he was born to be a tackle, and it's just it, it just I hope he develops into something. Obviously, my reaction with him when the Denver drafted him, I was a big fan of him. But, you know, it's still it's such a big thing of how much you develop. And with defensive linemen, it takes two to three years in the first place. But he had every he has everything to be a tackle. And that's the athleticism he had. It's part of why he got flipped over to the other side. Teams, especially in college, your athletes are the guys going after the quarterback. Uh, if you're if you're big enough and long enough, you're getting after the quarterback. If you're slower or if you're fast. And you have decent size. Well, you're a receiver. If you're a little bit smaller and you're fast, you're a running back. Um, if you're, you know, have the height and you have the speed, but you can't catch, congratulations, you're a defensive back. Um, the offensive line is abs- is ignored. Um, and an offensive line coach that I was talking about, a college offensive line coach, I was talking about that. He will always refer to the athletes as the best or the the best athletes as the offensive linemen. Even and then he'll sit there and follow it up. He goes, but it sucks because I can never get athletes to work with because they always get moved to a different position. Yeah, and it just it happens at every level of the NFL, making it harder to develop NFL quality NFL tackle talent. Yeah. All right, we got Phil coming back in with some more stars saying, "Is Seth Benson going to make the team?" My feeling is, if he does, it's because of his availability for special teams. What are your thoughts on Seth Benson? Um, maybe practice squad. I, I don't. I don't think he'll he'll make the the roster. Um, for special teams, I mean Jonas Griffith. Well, he didn't develop there on defense like we wanted to see last year. He's still a really good special teams player. And then you have Drew Sanders, who's going to be contributing on special teams. You have Josie Jewell and Alex Singleton as maybe your two starters. I don't see how you fit more than four linebackers. It would take some. It would take a huge surprise, I think, for Seth Benson to jump one of those four to make the roster. Yeah, I'm with you there. The Broncos obviously adding to the position with Drew Sanders, like you said, getting their two starters back from last year. You still got a couple other players that were on the roster last season, so it's it's an uphill climb. I mean, if he does show off really well in special teams, then yeah, maybe he gets that last linebacker spot. But otherwise, it's hard to see how he's making this team at this point. Injuries, obviously, always change the dynamics of how things are going to go. Hopefully, I mean, I'm, I'm knocking on wood here that the, the Broncos don't have the injury bug that they've had the last three or four seasons. Hopefully, <laughs> it's hard to be worse than what they have been. You know, it'll be interesting to see how this new training staff plays off for the Broncos. But right now, like I said, you said special teams or uh Practice squad probably is the best place for him right now. Yeah, I mean, and there's, as you said, injuries can always derail everything. Um, I mean, especially when two of the linebackers that we talked about, look at their injury history, Josie Jewell and Jonas Griffith. I mean, both of them. Um, Hopefully we aren't dealing with injuries, of course. Um, Hopefully, I mean, we're going to. Hopefully not on the level that we have over the last few years. Um, But, I mean, it's a good question. I'd. I didn't mind Seth Benson coming out going on draft. was exactly where I had him. Um, he's just, he's a smart guy. Um, his instincts are all right. Not over overly athletic. Um, so he's got, he's got the tools and traits to become a good special teams player. All right. And I figure let's get one more question here. Uh, we're almost at the, the one hour mark and appreciate everyone joining us here this evening. Eric, appreciate you joining me here last minute with Nick deciding that he needed to go see some more nature <laughs> i don't blame him he sent me some pictures and i was a little jealous but uh <laughs> string guy coming in saying anyone want to make a prediction prediction as to russ's touchdown to interceptions i think it's better with cook on the roster yes i would agree if cook's on the roster it's a lot better but wh- where where do you put him with sean payton um one touchdown to 17 interceptions <laughs> no um uh I mean, string guy comes in with saying 25 to 15. 
and that's probably in the range I would go. 20, 25 to 12 to 15. That's that's about where I would be. 25 and 12 is where I had him. Yeah. You know, really, Russ has been pretty good of not throwing interceptions throughout his career. Last year was kind of a little bit more of a fluke. And, and I'm the more I look back on last season and just the craziness and hearing a lot of the players and uh, just people within the organization talk about how horrible things were last year with the coaching staff, I'm, I'm starting to lean to put a little bit more back onto them compared to Russ. Now, Russ, I mean, he, he did a lot to himself. I'm not trying to say that he's blameless in this whole situation, but I, I think they, they gave him way too much power, obviously within the building. And he designed an offense that he thought he could run, but he couldn't. And unfortunately, sometimes as a, as a player, you know, you need somebody that can tell you, Hey, this is not who you are. You know, I, I was talking with, with someone earlier about golf since that's my, my main sport. And, you know, there's days I like to think, Hey, I can hit it 280, 300 yards, but I have to remember that's not my game. I'm a straight <laughs> down the middle, hit it straight, hit that 250, call it good. And there's just those days where I'm like, yeah, I can make it over this water. And I need that person. That's like, Carl, come on. That's not who you are. And, and Russ definitely me- needs that kind of guy. And I think Sean Payton easily is that guy. Like Sean Payton has no problem telling anybody what he thinks. And especially Russ, I don't think he's going to have any problem saying, Hey, you can't do this. You can't run this kind of offense. Yeah. I mean, and that's one thing I said last year is Russell Wilson's offense, but Hackett didn't have the authority, really the resume was the way I would put it to tell him no to things. You had a Super Bowl winner and multiple, been to multiple Super Bowls compared to Hackett. Um, so he couldn't tell him no. Well, Sean Payton, he can and he will tell Russell Wilson no. And as you're talking about with having that person there, everybody needs somebody to keep their ego in check, to make not let their ego r- run rampant. Um, and Wilson didn't have that last year, and I think it was a very humbling experience for him, and I do expect him to be better this year. Um, I still think there'll be times where he'll make some bad decisions, and uh, I know he hasn't thrown more than 10 interceptions a whole lot in his career, but I think part of the part of why I would go with that, you know, about 12 to 15 is because, you know, his arm isn't what it used to be. He can still make the throw sometimes, just not as consistently. Um, and last year, I mean, he was 16 to 11. So just bump up those touchdowns a little bit more. And there we go. All right. Well, everyone, I want to appreciate uh, you tuning in here this evening. And like I said, Eric, thank you for joining me. Make sure you guys are following us on Twitter at Carl Dumbler, MHH, Eric at Eric Trickle, and of course, Scott at Scout Kennedy. And then, of course, make sure you guys are following the pod accounts at MHH Pod. This one is at BTB underscore pod, uh, if I remember right, and at Mile High Huddle. Get on Twitter, guys. Make sure you guys are following. Send us any kind of questions you have if we didn't get to them here today. We love just talking football anytime, any day. Uh, we, we got somebody in our, our group that's always awake. We got some people overseas. So if it's 2 a.m., send out something to Mile High Huddle. Somebody will get to you. Make sure you also head on over to mhhmerch.com. Make sure you guys can go out there, get some some great hats. You know, um, my kids keep saying, Carl, you need to get, get me a hat. Well, they say dad, but um, but yeah, make sure you guys are heading out for that. And make sure you're also heading over to Facebook forward slash Mile High Huddle Pod. This lets you know anytime that our shows are starting, uh, so you do not miss any of these shows, be able to catch us live, and also head over to Apple Podcasts, leave us a, a five-star review, and you'll be put in each month for, for some different swag, whether it be a jersey, whether it be a hat, shirt, something like that. So we really appreciate all those reviews that you guys can get for us. You know, it really helps bump us up and get other people being able to see our show out there. And, of course, make sure you guys subscribe, like, and share. Uh, anytime you get a chance with these shows really bumps everything out there for us, gets new eyes on the show, gets us more opportunities just to, to reach people. And, and we just want to say thank you to all those who uh, brought in super chat and stars tonight, you know, Phil, Michael, uh, trying to think of who all brought stars tonight. Gary Palmer's another one that I know uh, brought some as well. Uh, Chris chances as well. Am I missing anybody? Troy Boer as well. Yes, thank you guys. I, I think I got everybody listed there. Um, I Like I said, if I missed you, I'm really, really sorry. We really do appreciate you. And just thank you for tuning in here this evening, getting a chance to talk some Bronco football. 
But as Nick always likes to say, make sure you guys are out there choosing kindness, choosing compassion, and go Broncos.